What's the difference between a one-part and a two-part mold for slit casting? And just as importantly, why would you want to use one or two parts? If you ignore the handles, all of these were done with one-part molds. Basically, I had one piece of plaster that I slip cast into. What that means is all of the pots are widest at the top and narrowest at the bottom. So even though they are different forms, they share that in common. So basically, that means you can use molds like this. This mold here is for this form, and this mold here is this form here. Hi, I'm Kent. I've been working on Shapecast, and one of my goals is being able to go beyond one-part molds into two-part molds, and eventually beyond that. However, what is the difference between these molds? Well, the simplest answer is that we only need one piece of plaster versus two. And to understand why you might need more than one piece of plaster, you need to understand two concepts. One is undercuts, and related is draft angles. The fundamental concept is when our slip goes in, it's liquid, so we can basically pour it into anything. However, it solidifies, and then we need to pull it out of the plaster, and we need to pull it out in one piece. So imagine we pour a slip in this, and we have our pot that forms. What we want to do is eventually pull the pot straight up so we can get it out, let it dry, biscuit, fire it, glaze it, all that good stuff. If the top were narrower, there would be no way to pull the pot out of the plaster. Actually, the clay does shrink a little bit, so we could potentially have a little bit narrower at the top. However, we're making these molds of 3D prints, and the 3D print doesn't shrink. While we might be able to get away with a little bit of an undercut with clay, we can't with the prints. I haven't used this mold in quite a while, but it lets me create a sphere like this, basically a moon jar type shape. And you'll notice it's in two pieces, and that's because we need to be able to pull it both directions. The plaster needs to be pulled off the bottom and off the top separately. So if you look at this, this looks like a normal bowl form. And this one is similar, only it has a hole in it. And the way this works is we stack it together. Like that, we rubber band it together, we pour in slip, we drain it back out. We then demold it, and we can take it off in two pieces. So imagine we have the pot that gets formed inside. This would be as big as the mold. It's shrunk because it's fired. So we pull it out and then we can demold the other part as well by pulling it the other way. This form here has an undercut if we look at trying to pull it straight up. There is no way we could pull this through because of the way it curves back in. So let's go back to one part molds. We have a few different pieces. We have the inner mold, which is this one here. It defines the shape of the pot. We have the plaster, and of course this goes in like that. So now we have inner mold plaster, inner mold plaster, and then we need an outer mold to contain the plaster, which basically replaces the cotta boards. That's this piece here, just like that. And then finally we have the ring that close it all off, which is this piece. And then we pour this upside down. And we pour in the plaster. We then demold everything once the plaster is set. Remove the ring, and then we can pull the 3D print out, leaving the cavity, which is what we use the slip cast. And this is what I mentioned before. While you might get away with a bit of an undercut with clay, we need to be able to pull the 3D print out as well. Having the 3D print permanently embedded in the plaster doesn't do us any good. So there needs to be no undercuts and a draft angle to be able to remove this piece when we're making the plaster mold. So what is an undercut? Well, as I just showed, we need to be able to pull the 3D prints up out of the plaster. So this line here represents the edge of the plaster. This is the boundary between the 3D print and the plaster. And if we consider every single point on here, we need to be able to pull it straight up. We need to be able to pull the prints straight out. So if we imagine any point here, we can draw a line and we don't hit anything else. This one here. So the foot is safe, but even the walls, even though it's a steep angle, we can pull straight up and we don't run into anything else. If this curved back in, we'd run into it and we get stuck, just like this curve here. We can't pull from the bottom straight up without running into the top. This angle here and this angle here is the draft angle. The closer it is to 90 degrees, the more we're pulling straight away from the plaster, the easier it is. The closer to zero degrees or parallel, the harder it becomes. Potentially, you could get away with a cylinder where it's straight up and down. However, at that point, we're sliding back and forth between each other. 
For the clay, it'd be okay because the clay shrinks a little bit. Getting the 3D print out of that would be a little bit tricky because basically all of the surface is rubbing against each other. Not to mention that the print actually isn't exactly perfect. There's slight ridges from the way the print works, so each of those potentially creates a small little undercut. So as long as your forearm looks like this, where you can basically pull straight up or potentially straight down, pull away from each other, you can get by with a one-piece mold. As soon as your forearm becomes more complicated, you need to go to two or potentially multi-part molds. The other multi-part molds I have are my handles. And we have the same problem. Because there is a curve on both sides, we can't pull just one direction. If so, we'd basically only have what looks like half a handle. What we need to be able to do is slip cast both sides together simultaneously. And that's what this does. So we can set this up together like this pour in the slip, and then once the slip is set, and in demolding it, we're pulling straight up, which means our handle's in the middle, and there are no undercuts. If you imagine cutting this in straight in half, there's a draft angle going this way, and draft angle's going that way. Towards the middle, they're relatively steep, as I was just talking about, but there's always an angle there. That was one of the reasons handles took a little bit longer for me to do, and it's because I needed to figure out how to do these two-part molds. And as one more example, this is a mug from Heath. Heath Ceramics, which is based up in Sausalito here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And this looks like it might be a one-piece mold, but it's actually two. And that's because if we take a straight edge, there's actually a very subtle curve. The top is slightly narrower. So there'd have to be a parting line here so that the, the bottom could be released and then the top could be released. So this is just like the sphere, only a much more subtle example. And of course the handle is again cast separately. This is a mug from Kurt Hammerly, Hammerly Ceramics. He actually uses a five-part mold system. However, this mug, again, ignoring the handle, could actually be done with two parts. So if we're looking at undercuts and draft angles, again, we need to be able to pull straight up from every point. However, if we drew a line from the bottom up, we would collide, that wouldn't work. So we need to be able to pull that way. The foot, we can pull that way, that way, etc. So this pot has one spot where it is the widest, that we could imagine drawing a line across. We could have a mold for the bottom part and a mold for the top part and separate it that way to release the slip cast pot. This isn't the only way you can divide up molds. It's the way I've been thinking about most recently. It's one of the simpler ways. You can actually divide the mold in any direction if you wanted to, but what you're really going after is no undercuts and being able to get the draft angles you want. What he actually does is cut this into five pieces. He splits the pot like this, so we can pull sideways, and he does this in quadrants, so there's another line on each side, and then he actually has a separate piece for the foot as well. He doesn't need to do this, but for his other mugs he does. So this is the same basic form, has that same curve, however his Vornoy pattern has all of these undercuts. These have been filled in with glaze, but each of these is a recess. So if you look at it from the side, they're all cupped in here. That would create an undercut. We can't pull straight up anymore because we run into the pot. Or likewise down here, we can't pull this way because we run into the pot. That's why he splits it so we can actually now pull out sideways. And we need the separate bottom piece because his foot is recessed. That means on the inside of the pot, there's a concave area and so we can't pull this way because we run into this part of the pot here. So this needs to go down and then the edges go out like that. This is actually similar to how the outer mold works with shape cast. We have these two pieces here and these get released by pulling out sideways out here. Potentially we could pull this straight down. The only undercut is right up here. And this is really just a nice idea. It doesn't impact the slip casting of the mold. However, our draft angles wind up being pretty bad. We have lots of things that are almost vertical and sliding the plaster out of the 3D print, if this were one piece, would be basically impossible. There's just too much surface area. The draft angles aren't good enough. But by pulling out, we're pulling basically perpendicular to the plaster itself. So back to our paper. This here is the outer mold. And we're pulling this way. So we have a really good angle. Because of this part right here, we can't pull straight down. If that wasn't there, if it just went over, we could potentially pull this way. 
However, we have a very steep angle and a lot of surface area. So that's why that doesn't really work so well. It depends upon the exact form that you have, but I found that pulling it sideways works. And Shapecast supports both two pieces and four pieces, similar to what Hammerly's doing with his actual plaster. He does it in four for the outside walls. And I'm sure you know these pots are as well. So Florian doesn't slip cast his pots. However, I think they're interesting to think about. Could we slip cast these and how many parts of a mold would we need? So he has a couple of really good pictures on Instagram that basically show straight on shots of all of his different forms. So there's these. Here's some that are in bisque so we see better contrast. He also posted some of his sketches showing the profiles. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail and see if we can do these as one part molds, two part molds, or they would require something more advanced. So here are a bunch of his different forms that I blew up. So let's go through them kind of one by one. So I'm gonna start down here. This form here is relatively straightforward. So here's the wall of the pot. And here's the foot. And we can see that there are good draft angles on this. We can draw lines and not intersect with anything, no problem. This could be done with a one piece mold. You can do this with Shapecast right now. This one down here is very similar. It goes down, goes over slightly, and then in would work with a one piece mold. This one here would require a two piece mold. It's fattest in the middle. So the bottom would be one mold like that. And then we would have to split it right here where he has the line. And then the top would be another mold upside down with a large opening in it, similar to the bowl. So this would be two one piece molds that are stacked on top of each other to create the two piece mold with the parting line down the middle horizontally. Going over to this one, this is a tall vase. The straight line is a little bit tricky. So I suspect what you'd want to do is taper it in or outwards. And I think it may have a bit of a taper. It's a little bit hard to tell. So I'm going to assume that the bottom is slightly wider than the top. So I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit here like that. You can then go over. And again, I'm going to assume the neck is necked in just a little bit. So this won't work because out here, this is the widest point and we can't pull it up without hitting the plaster. But we could split the foot off just like that. So this is one piece here, and then the other piece is up here. So now most of the pot is formed in the top upside down mold and just the foot is formed in the bottom. This one here would work as a one piece mold. This one would this one here would work as a two piece mold. Again, we could split it down the middle, have the bottom piece here, and then have the top piece. And while there is a lip here for the lid of the jar, which I'm gonna ignore for a second, but just the pot itself, that to me looks like it's probably one piece. This one here could be done with a one piece mold. So as you can see, by going into two pieces, we can actually get to many of the forms. This one we can't do. So if we split it here, the bottom part works no problem. Unfortunately, there's this area that's necked in and we can't go up or down. Here we'd have to split it and pull it to the sides. So if we split it vertically, we could then pull outwards. And this would be more like what Hammerly does with his pots. And that's because this area here creates an undercut if we want to try and pull it up. By pulling it out laterally, we don't have that problem. So this one here may work. His foot goes straight down. So potentially there's nothing rubbing as we try and pull it out. You might wanna add a little bit of a taper here so that the foot doesn't get stuck, but this would probably work as a one piece mold as well. This large vase looks like it's okay. Again, it depends upon exactly how the top of the vase works, but this here is the widest point. You do a bottom piece and then a separate top piece like that. 
So you can see quite a few of his forms actually work just fine with two-piece molds, which is one of the reasons I'm trying to get them into Shapecast. Of course, there are a bunch of exceptions. This one here would not work. There is a narrow part here, which would create an undercut. We can't go up or down. So this would require splitting vertically. Same for this one. This one's probably the same. This one's the same, etc. I printed this one out in black and white so the contrast is a little bit better. Several of these would work okay. So this one goes over, down, over, down. That would be okay. This bowl here would work okay. This face here, if we split it halfway, down, over, down, over. This one would not. Has a problem being too narrow in the middle. This one here also would not. Again, it's the narrowest right here, so there's no way to pull the foot from the rest of the pot without splitting it sideways. One other thing to note is that while the outside of Florian's bowls tend to be rather angular, the insides tend to be rather curved. And that isn't really represented here. So for instance, this one here, I suspect what he would do is he would trim this so that it was more bowl-like and swooped over. This would be hard to do with slip casting with a one piece mold, ignoring any other constraints on the form. That's because you really only define one side of the surface. There are techniques where you can actually have an inner mold as well. Those are often used with plates, but potentially could be worked with this bowl. So even if this form worked, so for instance, this one right here looks okay, being able to get that soup on the inside would require an additional mold. That's different than the ones I've been talking about. I think the other thing that's interesting is to think about the lids. So for these lidded forms, as I was printing them out, I was looking at them a little bit more closely. So I'm gonna turn it upside down so it looks more like a pot we've been thinking about. So let's look at this lid here. We could think of this maybe as a two-part mold as well. So the bottom, so I flipped it upside down. So the top of the lid, but kind of conceptually the bottom of the pot, like if this was thrown, you'd throw it upside down. We have one profile like this, I think that would work okay. And then the other one would be like this. And so again, those could be split right here. So we would get the shelf for the gallery and the lid form itself. The difference is he has a fair bit of thickness to his lids. And again, with slip casting, you wind up with just a, a kind of a uniform profile. However, I think you could get this geometry, which isn't something I'd really considered before. So that's kind of cool. We might be able to do some lidded forms. Should we try? Sounds like a good idea for a future video. Hopefully that demystifies one versus two versus multi-part molds. For Shapecast, I am going to prioritize splitting horizontally, much like I did with this sphere here. This required a little bit of trickery to get to work with Shapecast, but I want to support that more directly. The simplest thing to do, which is probably where I'll start, is to take the profile of the pot and cut it at the widest point. And then you process two separate files, one that gives us each half. The bottom part works just as is, no changes, except we need to turn off the slip well. And I've made that an option inside the code recently. I need to expose it in the web interface still when I make the new version go live. And in the bottom, basically what we need is a drain hole. This is where we fill in the slip. I think what I'll do is maybe set an option where you can specify the diameter of the hole you want to do. This could also be used, for instance, for large planters. When you get to really big slip cast pieces, it's often useful to have a drain hole in the bottom, and this could also be used for that. So I think it's a useful feature regardless. The more advanced version would take the form and split it in half automatically. I think that is reasonably straightforward, but I'm going to try and do the simplest thing first. That way we can start unlocking some of these more interesting forms. And as homework for you, go look at some of your favorite pots and figure out how many piece molds are required. Can you do it with a one piece mold like this? or several of Florian's pieces, do you need a two-piece mold split horizontally, or do you need to do something more complex like what Hammerly does and actually go into, for instance, a five-part mold? Hope you found that interesting. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. Thanks.